Listen, today we are going to continue in this series on coffee mug Christianity and bringing clarity and context to the cliche things, those little verses we pull, one here, one there, or that we think the Bible says, and then when we get, well, anyway, turn the page and find out that's not quite it. And so um, today we want to deal with this verse. We want to tackle the verse. We love this verse, y'all. I can do, let me see if you guys can do it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's right. I can do all things. We have this on canvases on our wall. We have it on our coffee mugs. We have it on our t-shirts. I have it. I have it. I have it on a t-shirt. I can do team 413. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yes, I was wearing a tutu. It was for the Disney half princess half marathon. Okay. Got the t-shirt. We have turned this verse into the Christianese version of the little engine that could. It has become our self-help. I can, I can, I can. (laughs) And I have to wonder if that's what Paul really intended for it to be. I have to wonder if that was what was in his heart. But before we even get to that, why don't we look at what Paul actually said in Philippians 4.13? Read with me. I can do all this. Oh, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. I can do all this. By the way, Paul is writing a letter to the church in Philippi. We're going to see where he gives them all kinds of instructions. So not only does he not say all things, he says all this, but he doesn't say you can do all this. He says, I, I can do all this, but we'll, we'll get to that later. Right now, how about we just talk about the all this that Paul is telling us he can do? Because if I read the couple verses above that, Paul says, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret to being content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or living in want. I can do all this through Christ who gives me strength. When is the last time we were lacking or in need and expressed great contentment with God? Mm. I don't know about the online family, but in the house, it's silent. We're not even going to go quiet. We're going to go silent, like if the air conditioner weren't running. (laughs) When's the last time we were hungry and content? Y'all, our culture has created a whole new verb to express the grumpiness that we're allowed to feel if we are one hour late past a meal. It's called being hangry. I use the verb. We've given ourselves a verb and an excuse to act like a jerk to the people who love us and spend time with us and work with us if we miss mealtime while a great portion of this world is lucky to get one meal. I can do all this. And through Christ who gives me strength. And through is like the fulcrum word there. It is the important word, and it's the word we most blow past. I can do it through Christ. It gives me strength. Like, it's all of that. And you know that word through actually means the space or place within which something is found. So Paul can be hungry and in need and still content because the place and space in which he is found is Jesus. How many times have we used this verse to claim victory, to charge the hill, to do the thing, and it's not a single thing that Christ ever asked us to do, and it's not in a place he's called us to be. Can I ask, how can I be strong because I'm found in the place of Jesus if I've put myself out somewhere Jesus didn't ask me to go? Now, don't get me wrong. God is with us everywhere. He never leaves us or forsakes us. I don't want to take away from that. But this verse says that I have strength in him when I am in the place where I am found in him. 
but we've been talking about context. So let's go past this verse because this statement is made in a letter that Paul is writing to the church in Philippi. And so who is Paul writing to? What is his context? Why is he even writing this, right? Because if we wanna take this verse We have to understand the context in which it's said to gather everything. And so the context, if I turn back, first let me give you a heads up. Paul is in prison in Rome, okay? He is writing to a church that's one of his favorites. We'll get to that in a couple minutes. But the church in Philippi is hand down the golden child for Paul, and we'll get to the why in a minute. But Paul is in prison, and he's writing to them. He says this, they're going to put it up on the screen so you can read along. In Philippians 1, 12 to 14, he says, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains... Most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Paul is literally chained in prison in a not friendly place in chains for the gospel. And he says, and because of my chains, other people are being more courageous. Isn't it great? The context is that Paul is in chains, but he's still rejoicing. He's still happy. He goes on in verses 15 to 17. He says, It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, and others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I'm here, I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely. Supposing, what's the why? Supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. Because being in prison isn't bad enough. Somebody's got to be jealous and be, feel there's a rivalry there and try to outdo Paul or say things to get Paul into even more trouble while he is already in prison. Can I ask, have you ever had someone treat you badly out of jealousy? Amen. Have you ever had that rival that just like for no reason, like you didn't do anything to them? And they just got to stir it up to make it hard for you. Someone jealous of your position or your authority or your promotion or your performance. And so they start to lash out in other ways in this false sincerity and attack. I remember the first real deployment that I went on. Now, I recognize that Pastor Rick and Leroy would still say that this was not an actual real deployment. I would tell you that there was not there were not flushing toilets, there was only scattered electricity, and there were outhouses. And so in my mind, that is a real deployment. But yep, see, see, so it's a real deployment. Aim for an Air Force chick, that's a real deployment, okay? And so, um, but I went on my first real deployment to this big exercise in Egypt, right? And I worked super hard. Like, I poured out everything I had had. My military career didn't start out great, Pastor Jessica could tell you about that another time. Probably she shouldn't. But, um, but I had worked really hard to learn to walk in integrity and character and dependability. And I poured everything I had into this deployment. And I really did a good job. Like, and, and a lot of it was just circumstance. I was supporting an admiral. I had a lot of experience with senior officers. I spoke Arabic. And we had an Egyptian general that we needed to co-labor with. So it was going great. Like, I was kicking butt and taking names like it was really good and um and there was a group of ncos that had nothing to do with my part of the mission and they started to stir up trouble they started to say some things that weren't true they started to poke holes in things they actually called back to the headquarters in tampa from egypt to talk to one of my bosses to say We don't think something's right. Now, meanwhile, I'm calling Pastor Rick. I'm calling Rick going, I want to make sure I'm doing this right. And he's like, no, you're spot on. Don't worry about it. Keep doing what you're doing. You're good to go. But it stirred up all this trouble, right? How do you think I responded to that? Can you guess how I responded to that? 
Let me tell you, this was, we hadn't even gotten in church yet together, okay? Like, I was devastated and I was redheaded hot mad. I was angry. I was furious. This was back before my red hair needed an assist, you guys. Like, everything full on fire, every hair standing up. I was not at all happy. But Paul would have said, no, Jen. You got that all wrong. Because when Paul faced rivalry, when Paul faced people stirring up trouble, he goes on, like the verses I just read you, he goes on to say, but what does it matter? The important thing that is in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. So the context, I can do all this through him who strengthens me. The context is that loved or hated, Paul is still Rejoicing. Now, we can understand where Paul is at. We understand Paul is imprisoned. We understand Paul is in change. He's in Rome. So that gives us some context for the letter. But who is he writing to and why is he writing to them? Already mentioned he's writing to the church in Philippi. He's got a really special affection for this church. Like, you, if you read through the pastoral epistles, the pastoral letters... He, he talks to them differently. Like Corinth, he says, I'm appealing to you to solve your quarrels and your division. Galatia, he literally says, I'm astonished at how quickly you have deserted me and abandoned the true gospel. Philippi, he writes, thanking God every time I remember you. You're all, I'm always praying with joy because of the partnership we've had from beginning to now. Like these are his favorite kids, Okay. And he's writing to encourage them because they're facing a a place in time in history where there is a megalomaniac ruler named Nero on the throne in Rome, and his goal is to persecute Christians. And when I say persecute, I mean line them up on stakes and set them on fire to light the pathway to his house parties. That was a regular practice. And Paul is saying, I am writing to encourage you I need you to know that it is going to be okay. He tells them that his prayer, because Paul always starts out his letters, right? Here's good context. You want to know what he's writing about? Go to the prayer he gives them at the beginning. He starts out with his prayer in verses 9 to 11, that you may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and be pure and blameless. It's all about learning to love more, be pure, do the things. Paul is like, I am cheering you on because what you have. And so it's important that we understand that this letter is not correction like it often is with Paul. This is a letter of encouragement and instruction because they're going to need the strength of Christ to get through what they've got to get through. And so Paul is writing to set them up for that. And so, when gaining context, one, for if you aren't familiar with Philippians, it's only four chapters. We're certainly not going to read all four chapters. That's okay. But we're going to hit the wave tops because in gaining context, I want you to understand what Paul was trying to communicate across the breadth of this letter. Because if we don't understand the depth of the situation, then we're not going to walk away empowered by what indeed is one of the great powerful promises of scripture that needs to be properly put into perspective so that we can walk strengthened in it. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. So in hitting the wave tops, we want to look at the broad instructions that Paul gives them in every circumstance at all times that they are to do, right? And so I want to invite you to read with me um, verses 27 and 28 of chapter 1. Whatever happens... Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. He says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves worthy in a manner worthy of the gospel. So I have to ask us, even in the small, simple things, how are we handling the opposition? How are we handling ourselves in the face of our opposition? (laughs) 
Yesterday, I was at a local restaurant. I wanted to go buy a couple quarts of potato salad because I'm preaching on Sunday morning. I don't have time to make potato salad to take to the picnic, but I wanted to get good potato salad because who likes bad potato salad, right? Anyway, so I met a local establishment that I love. They're great. Um, and they, I bought a certain amount, and they didn't measure it out right. And I saw they didn't measure it out right, and I saw what they handed me wasn't the amount I paid for. And so I asked the first question, and they were like, no, we did what we're supposed to do. And so then one of the other leader team leaders came over, and I'm like, um, this is not that. And he was like, yeah, yes, yes, it is. And everything rose up inside of me, and I was like, because y'all, I tell you every week, God has me live what I'm preaching. Conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I was like, okay. Now, I'm going to call the manager today. I measured it out. I took pictures. I'm going to take the right action. That doesn't mean get stepped on and taken advantage of. But it means don't lose your full head in the middle of the restaurant, okay? Like, don't, if you don't have the self-control to get it together, if you're feeling a little off, then take a beat. Because in all things, in all things, whatever happens, conduct yourself worthy in a manner worthy. And that's so small and petty. And Paul isn't talking about small and petty. Paul is talking about Nero burning Christians at stake. Paul is talking about wars in Ukraine and persecution of Christians in Afghanistan and people hating people for no other reason than the color of their skin or the party that they like or who they vote for. Paul is talking about serious things. And he says, in this manner, but in the manner worthy of the gospel, don't back down. Stick together. Stick together not to be ugly. Stick together in a manner worthy of the gospel. Because the Team 413 shirt that I love to wear wasn't meant for a half marathon or taking my own hill or chasing my next thing. It was meant for unity and courage and for the gospel. So Paul's first commission to this church is do all this. Remember, because it's not do all things. Do all this fearlessly and do it all for the gospel. Being found in Christ, you guys. I'm going to keep hitting that because it's, it all comes back to that through him. Being found in Christ. His next instruction to them all comes in chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. Read with me. Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. When was the last time we put somebody else's interests ahead of our own? Mm. I'm going to keep it real. I don't mean like the drive-through difference where we have $50 in our wallet and we pay our own Chick-fil-A and then we decide to get the person behind me because there's only two people in the car, so we're safe. I mean, when's the last time you decided to go without lunch so you could bless somebody with lunch? When's the last time you sacrificed something so that you could bless someone else? Are are we using the strength that we have in Christ to put our spouse's needs or desires ahead of our own or to champion our own cause? Are are we using it to stay? Mm, I'll save that. I'm going to pause that for just a moment. In all the things, where are we looking for Christ's strength to motivate us? And what are we looking for it to motivate us to do? Because Paul says that it should motivate us to do nothing out of selfishness, out of our own ambition, out of our own ego, but to do it all valuing others above ourselves, looking to their interests first. Today, As a nation, this whole weekend is not about barbecues. It's about honoring those who have put our nation first and paid the ultimate price to do that. 
There's a lot of us in this congregation that are military. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I got a real check in my spirit a couple of years ago because God gave us this really big thing to go do. And it wasn't going to be easy. And quite frankly, it wasn't going to be pleasant. It was going to be a lot of hard work. And it meant giving up a lot of things that we really liked. And as I, as I did this a little bit with God, he was like, what, you'll take an assignment or go on a mission for the nation, but you're going you're gonna to step back when I ask you to give up. You'll deploy there, but not, yeah. And it was a good check. Because I think a lot of times we can treat our Christian walk like this, like in the clouds kind of thing, like it's all happy and good feelings. And it is, don't get me wrong, Jesus came to give us life and life in abundance. I live a joyful, joy-filled life. But we're here on mission. Leonard's got his shirt, I'm here on a work visa. We're here on mission, and sometimes the assignments aren't going to be pretty or great or fabulous or happy, and that shouldn't stop us for one second from stepping up and saying, send me, because if that's where you've asked me to go, that's where I'll be found in you. Paul's commission here to do all this in love, in unity, and in selfless humility Found where? In him. Found in Christ. He goes on to say, do everything. (laughs) Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without finding children of God. Let me read this with you because I have it messed up on my iPad. Without fault in a warped and crooked generation, somehow I had without finding fault in a warped, and I was like, wait a second, that's not right. So let me just try that again. Do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among the stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. It's true, guys, our, our world is less friendly to Christians than it used to be. And doing everything without grumbling or complaining is not easy. But the attitude check that I have for us is doing things through him, right? Doing it in him strengthens, mean that we're found in Christ and in the middle of the difficult situations, is it obvious to everyone that we're found in Christ? Or is it obvious to everyone that we aren't very appreciative of where we're currently found? Are we, as, as Paul is about to tell us, let your gentleness be evident to all, are people seeing Christ in us or are they seeing us wishing that we weren't with them? in the midst of our difficulty. Online family, once again, it is really quiet in the house. I have to ask myself this question today. When I am dealing with difficult people, when the situation is not going my way, when I, for the sake of the gospel, have to uproot some things, go some places I didn't want to go, hang out with some people I didn't necessarily want to hang out with, Is the world seeing Jesus or is the world seeing my attitude about being stuck where I've been called? Paul's commission here is to do all this without grumbling and complaining. How's our grumbling life? How's our rejoicing life? Because I'll go back to Paul's context, rejoicing in chains, rejoicing as he's hated, rejoicing as his rivals come after him, rejoicing in the Lord. You're like, Pastor Jen, this is really heavy. I know, but it's good. We're getting there. Because it builds us up. Because y'all, it, it's not so hard to not be found in Jesus when it's all roses and happy and rainbows. But let me tell you what, when it is hard, you don't want to be anywhere else but found in Jesus. Read with me chapter 4, 
verses 4 through 6, because we got another one of those always statements. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Let it be evident to all in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. Rejoice when? Always. Rejoice always. Our gentleness, let it be evident to our friends, to the people who we have compassion for. Let our gentleness be evident to the people who look like us, vote like us, talk like us, think like us. Everybody. Let our gentleness be evident to all. Rejoice, not being anxious, but praying. Rejoice and pray when your wayward child goes further and further away from the way you raised them up to go when you are stressed out. Rejoice. Rejoice and pray when your spouse won't plug in where they think you think they need to plug in. Don't grumble and complain. Let your gentleness be evident to all. When your wife needs to move the rug and knocks over the mic stand 10 minutes before service and it all needs fixed, Pastor Rick let his gentleness be evident. He did not fuss. I know in his heart he was listening to the passages he had typed in for me, I'm pretty sure. Thank you, Pastor Rick. Praying, not complaining. Rejoicing not becoming bitter. Because Paul's commission here is to do all this, rejoicing, being gentle, prayerful, and thankful. Y'all, your pastor is not perfect. Well, you got a lot of pastors in this room. We're blessed like that. But I'm going out on a limb. None of your pastors are perfect. We, We don't get this right every time. It is not easy to be thankful. Some of you don't know the the sordid past. Pastor Rick and I happily married for well over 20 years, but before that, it was a hot mess. There was was no part of me that wanted to be thankful when my ex-husband pulled a custody stunt and I'm in emergency court and I am bawling my eyes out about my five-year-old son. Like, nothing in me wanted to be thankful in that circumstance. But I had to make a choice. I was newer in my walk, and God was like, you going to trust me? Or are you going to try to do this on your own? Because by the way, doing it on your own got you where you're at. But that's a whole nother sermon for a whole nother day. I know it's not easy to be thankful. But he calls us to be thankful. And there's a reason, because when we're thankful, we can be found in Christ. But really, if we take the context Paul wrote in, and we've got, yeah, got some better handles on we can do all this through him who strengthens us, we don't have Nero. We're not being burned at the stake. We're not in Ukraine. We're not Christians in Afghanistan. We're not facing life and death for the most part in this nation. So what does this mean for us? How do we let this word transform us, strengthen us in the right way, stop using one of the most powerful promises of scripture to charge the hill or run my half marathon or take my own victory when that's not what God intended? What does it look like in real life I want to tell you about a classmate that I had several years ago when I was in seminary. And I want to make a public service announcement first because we've got some newer folks in the room and certainly not, not have, we're not even sure who's online with us. We know some of our online family. We don't know others, right? So public service announcements. I have very close friends on both sides of the political aisle. I actually have very close friends from this end of the spectrum to this end of the spectrum and everywhere in between. People in this room on the regular sit on different sides of many different political divides. Now, warning, this is not a political statement. So 
Y'all, we're keeping it real. Everybody keep your face straight while I tell this story. I don't want any politic reactions here, okay? I want you to hear the heart of the story. Some of us are like, I wish we had our masks back on. That would help. So back to this friend of mine from seminary classmate. What I'll tell you about her is that she, um, she was a staunch supporter of building a wall. Okay, she really felt like the best way to secure our southern border was to get the wall built. Again, not a political statement, but that was what she believed. And she was presented an opportunity to go serve on the southern border of our nation to serve children who had been separated from their parents. And without hesitation, she leaped into that opportunity. She took two weeks off of work. She went down there in 105, 110, 115 degree heat without any nice, like, Motel 6 would have been a step up from their accommodations, okay? And she poured it all out to these children and to their families. She poured all out serving them because she wanted to be found in Christ in what he had called her to do. Because serving those kids had nothing to do with the politics. Because her gentleness being evident to them so that they knew that Christ was near had nothing to do with how she voted or what she believed. It had everything to do with building the kingdom of God because he said to consider the needs of others before her own needs or her own beliefs. Because kingdom priorities trump national politics every single day of the week as we call the name of Jesus Christ. Because Paul says to rejoice in all things, to let our gentleness be evident to all, to put the needs of others always first. And did she take it to prayer? You bet. Was it hard? Absolutely. I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. I want you to picture yourself jumping into the other side of the aisle for two weeks of immersion living where you need to filter everything you think and say and how you feel to serve the mission you've been called to do. Not easy. Hot, nasty, and sweaty. Not comfortable. But... As she put the kingdom needs before her own, God blessed her. He transformed her life. She came back more on fire for Jesus. By the way, she did not come back with her political views changed. That was, I don't think that was ever God's intention. <laughs> she came back so on fire for the kingdom of God with such a passion for serving children that she actually shifted the, the concentration of her major in seminary because she allowed herself to be found in Christ for the sake of the gospel. And in all of it, she was strengthened. And when I thought of how to explain this verse, she exemplified this verse to me. I don't know what each of us is facing this week. I don't know what we will, I don't know what I'm going to face this afternoon. But I know whether it is in the little or the big, I will be given opportunities. And in those opportunities, I can trust in my flesh and charge that hill on my own and claim some verse back here that's not at all connected to what I'm doing. Or I can step into what God invites me into and in a powerful kingdom way, walk in his strength. Because the bottom line, church, is this. Um, God is always with us. He will never leave us or forsake, that, for forsake us. I said that in the beginning. I'm going to restate that now. God is always with you. No matter where you go, God is with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. As his child, you are in the palm of his hand. However, operating in his strength requires positioning ourselves in Christ for the sake of the gospel and the work of the kingdom. And in that Bridge Church, we're game for that. I'm getting that. We're remaking. We can't take Team 413's logo, but we'll make a logo. We'll, we'll get the shirt. We'll get the t-shirts, but it won't mean charge the hill on our own. It'll mean placing ourselves, positioning ourselves in Christ for the sake of the gospel and the work of the kingdom.
So my question for us as we close is this week, in the big and in the small, where will we be found? Leonard, would you come up and pray for us, please? Church, will you stand as we pray? Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this message, Lord, of looking to you, Lord, that so many times, Lord, when, when all was going well, we forget, we forget about you, Lord. We look to ourselves because everything is going great, but when those times, Lord, when things are going wrong, Lord, when you have a crack radiator, Lord, or my ex has sent me a whack text, Lord, those are the times when I have to look to your strength, Lord. That's when I have to look to you, Lord. I think about this shirt I have on, Lord, that says I'm here on a work visa, Lord. And I say, put me in, coach, put me in, but I want to run the play. I want to decide when I'm going to pass the ball or what I'm going to do, Lord. But you're directing us, Lord. So let me always, let us always look to you, Lord, in those situations when things aren't going well, Lord. When we feel like <laughs> saying something back, Lord, or or rebelling, or whatever it might be, Lord. Let us be like Paul, Lord, and rejoice in every situation, Lord, looking to you as our strength, Lord, realizing, Lord, that we are inadequate, Lord. There, there is no strength in us, Lord, and we look to you, and we understand our mission is Christ, Lord, and not ourselves. And we ask this in your precious and mighty and matchless name. Amen.